Thank you for joining us tonight for this virtual event with explorer and author Wade Davis, here to talk about his new book, Magdalena, River of Dreams, A Story of Columbia. This event is presented in partnership with the Colombian Embassy. Joining the author tonight are panelists, distinguished guests, Ambassador to the U.S. Francisco Santos Calderon, Juan Pablo Banila, and Paula Caballero. Francisco Santos Calderon is a Colombian politician and journalist. He is currently serving as Ambassador of Colombia to the United States. Juan Pablo Banilla is the manager of the Inter-American Development Bank's climate change and sustainable development sector. Paula Caballero is the managing director of the Lands for Life program at RARE. In this virtual format, Politics and Prose continues to bring you exciting programs with the authors you love and their new books. Please support us and them by purchasing the book. At any time during the event, you can click on the chat and the Q&A widget to ask a question. We will also place the link there that takes you to the Politics and Prose website to purchase Wade Davis's new book. I am honored to introduce the author of tonight's featured book, Magdalena, River of Dreams, a book that celebrates the country and culture of Colombia. Wade Davis is an ethnographer and botanical explorer who receives his degrees at Harvard University. He is the author of over 20 books, including The Serpent and the Rainbow, One River, The Wayfinders, and Into the Silence. As readers, some of us live vicariously through exploration. Wade Davis enlivens these explorations and brings us along on the journey to experience the people and places firsthand through his writing and narratives. He has traversed the planet from the Amazon rainforest to Nepal, Haiti, Benin, Toga, and Greenland. He is Canadian and currently a professor of anthropology and holds the leadership chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk at the University of British Columbia. He is a vocal advocate for the, words, for the world's indigenous peoples, cultures, and languages. Wade tells many vivid and passionate stories throughout the book, beginning with a trip as a wide-eyed 14-year-old. His writing is permeated with keen observations of the geography of the landscape, the spirit of place, contemplations of life and death, magic realism, and cumbia music. It truly is a love letter to a wondrous country. Please welcome Wade Davis, Ambassador Francisco Santos Calderon, Juan Pablo Banila, and Paolo Caballero. Thank you uh, very much for uh, to Politics and Prose for allowing us to have this uh, amazing conversation with, uh, with a fantastic human being and a human being that, uh, that all Colombians have to be grateful because I would say of all the places in the world he has been and that you described, the one he loves the most is Colombia. He's written a, a, one of the most marvelous books that, that, that I've read called Del Rio. Uh, I remember when I gave it to my kids to read it, they were in awe. Uh, it opened their mind. And now he writes again about another river, about the Magdalena River. Uh, and Wade is, is, has such, a, such an amazing love for Colombia that, uh, that those books just uh, you know, open your heart and, 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 and help you understand a little bit of what Colombia is. But uh, Wade, I read this, uh, this uh, introduction about Wade, which is fantastic. He's a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and a passionate defender of all of life diversity. And uh, this is what, what he is. But let me start with the uh, with, with, with first question, Wade. Why rivers? Why, uh, why when you look at Colombia, this imagination and all of what uh, you write has to has to move around rivers well ambassador first of all let me thank you for participating and leading this conversation especially a day or so after you've become a grandfather of a beautiful <laughs> girl we all send you um, our love to your family and uh, and our congratulations and and paula it's wonderful to see you again and Juan Paulo, and i really appreciate you taking the time to help you know rivers um, it's like the mamos say, you know, rivers are the conscience of a nation, you know, rivers are the arteries of life. A friend of mine once wrote 
to me from India that on the on the wild rivers you're never far from the Ganges veins of the earth, and um, and, and in the case of Colombia. Um, the Magdalena isn't simply the main artery of the nation in the sense the Mississippi of Colombia running south to north a thousand miles into the sea. It's the very reason that Colombia exists as a nation. Uh, it's of course the valley in which four out of every five Colombians live, the valley that generates 80% of the economy, the river that lights the cities of the hinterland. And it's, of course, a quarter of commerce, but it, more, more importantly, in a sense, it's a fountain of culture. You know, it's a point of origin of poetry, literature, uh, music, and prayer. And, you know, it's curious, peel off the, 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 the pages of any book, uh, look through the memories of any family in Colombia, and you will always find the Rio Magdalena. And yet, at the same time, there's been a kind of a collective amnesia about the river that is sort of haunting. Um, and, and I myself was absolutely guilty of the same sin in a way. And it kind of is a sin because to turn your back on the Magdalena is almost an act of treason if you know how important the river is in the history of this incredible country. But, you know, if you look at the book that the ambassador mentioned, El Rio, which came out in the Spanish translation by a beautiful Colombian poet. It's really Nicholas's book. It's not my book. The Spanish book El Rio belongs to Nicholas Sesquan. And, and that book in Spanish stretches to something on close to 700 pages. The word Magdalena appears five times. And so you can imagine my, my joy when I suddenly um, stumbled upon uh, the river that really created the, the nation. Um, and, and so the story of Columbia is a Magdalena. The, the Columbia itself is a gift of the river. Um, and the river has had hard times. It's been the cemetery of the nation, but it's never betrayed the people. It's always flowed. And in a sense, what this book is subtly arguing is that maybe it's time to give back to the river by cleansing it of all that has um, soiled its waters over the many years. Um, you know, the one consistent theme in the five years of research of this book, and whether it was with a campesino in a macizo de Colombi Colombiano, this rugged knot of mountains and where, where, where the three great arms of the Cordillera spread out to the Caribbean coastal plain, the fountain of the great rivers of Colombia, the Cauca, the Magdalena, the Batia, the Putumayo, the Caquetá, whether it's a campesino there or a a, a fisherman at, at the river mouth where on a jetty that goes out in the Caribbean in, in, in simple shacks of wood, grayed by the sun, <coughs> decorated as if in conscious uh, re uh, uh, rejection of despair, beautiful lines of poetry. You know, I mean, this is a crazy thing about Colombia. You know, they talk about magical realism as, as Colombia's great gift to, to, to literature. But Gabo, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, he was a journalist. He was an observer all of his life. He just happened to live in a land where heaven and earth converge on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. And so to tell the story of Columbia is to tell the story, Ambassador, of the, the, the mighty Magdalena River. And everybody I met on that entire Cuenca always said, to heal ourselves, we must heal the river. To cleanse our soul as a nation, we must cleanse the river. To cleanse the river will be to clean our soul. And that becomes a kind of a motif of the entire book, I suppose. Hey, for a little bit of background to, to many of, of, of the persons who are um, joining us in this conversation, and before we go into the, mm -hmm. the Magdalena River, and we have Juan Pablo Bonilla, an expert uh, in... Uh, in, uh, in um, in the environment and Paula to, to comment on, on the river and, and what to do because, because uh, uh, what we want to do is, is have a, a vivid conversation of where do we move forward? Why is your love for Colombia? When, when did Colombia drop in your mind and, and how did you fa fall in love with Colombia like you did? You know, you've been all over the world, but yeah, but, you know, go I, back to Colombia. <laughs> you know, Ambassador, I think you, a traveler always falls in love with a place that first embraces their spirit and gives them license to be free. 
And I was very fortunate that my mother was a, a simple but determined Canadian woman who, if you can imagine, in 1968 told me that Spanish was the language of the future. And she worked all year as a secretary in a small school to save enough money to allow me to join a small group of schoolboys that a teacher was taking to Cali. And you know, 1968, most North Americans had never been in an airplane. So the South American destination was terribly exotic. And I was very fortunate because at 14, I was the youngest of the group by far. And the other lads were all with these wealthy families uh, who spent a sort of sweltering season in the streets of Cali. And I was billeted with a more modest family in the mountains above the city at the edge of trails that reached west to the Pacific. And it was a kind of classic Colombian scene, you know, children too many to keep track of, an indulgent father, a grandmother who sat by herself on a deck overlooking flowers and fruit trees, muttering to herself, uh, an angelic sister who more than once carried my friend Jorge Eduardo Franco and me back home half drunk to a woman, a mother kind beyond words who stood by the stone steps, tapping her foot on the stones, pretending to be angry. And there was just something about the warmth of Latin culture. You know, I would remember, you know, at 14, I would, I would go to parties, fiestas, and one moment I'd be, I didn't even know, I wasn't even old enough to have a girlfriend or a novia, but I had one anyway. And I, I would be dancing with my novia in one moment and then dancing with her mother the next moment. You don't do that in Canada, you know, and and and, you know, the funny thing about it is all the other Colombian, not all of the other Canadian boys, but many of them suffered from manmitis, you know, from homesickness. And I, by contrast, felt like I had finally found home. It was just absolutely overwhelming. Um, and then, of course, I returned six years later uh, in the shadow of the legendary botanical explorer Richard Evan Schultes. And I spent 15 months um, going wherever my spirit led me, living on the streets, sleeping where my hat fell. And at no point, even as I crisscrossed the Darien and went to the Valpez and went to the Sierra and Puto Mayo and Nariño and, and uh, you name it, I never was afraid. The warmth of the Colombian people enveloped a young traveler like a protective cloak tailor made for wonder. You know, and I, I again, I, I want to stress that, you know, you know, Hemingway once said that um, um, uh, writing books, anyone who says that writing a book is easy is either a bad writer or a liar. Books are tough and you have to have some kind of sense of mission, I think, to 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 work your way through a long five year book project. And for me, justice or or the truth is always a strong motivator. And I I. Um, came back to Colombia for a number of projects based on the success of El Rio, uh, film projects and so on. Um, and, and I was invited to join a group of, uh, a wonderful group supported by one of Colombia's great corporate citizens, Grupo Argos, um, who were sponsoring um, uh, scholars, botanists and journalists led by Hector Rincón and Ana Cano out of, out of Medellín, acclaimed journalist and we these five books that were being produced of all the five major regions of the country were not to be sold but to be gifted to every library in the country to send a message to a new generation of Colombians that there was not a country of violence and war but a, a place of the greatest biodiversity um, of any of any nation a save Brazil which is so much bigger but in terms of geographical cultural ecological um, a topographical diversity, there is no place on earth like Colombia. There is no place in Colombia more than a day removed from every known ecological habitat to be found on the earth. And, and, and the truth of Colombia is not what people believe. It's not a place of violence. I mean, in a country of 50 million people during a 50 year war that wouldn't have lasted a day had it not been for the consumption of cocaine throughout the world, driving the flames of war. Um, throughout all of those troubles, there were never more than 200,000, maybe 300,000 combatants on all three sides of this horrible uh, war and conflict uh, in a country of 50 million people. The vast majority of Colombians who have never seen, let alone use cocaine, were victims of a conflict that never would have happened without the consumption of drugs. I always say to Americans, how would you feel if Canada had patterns of drug consumption in bars and boardrooms across the country 
and laws that facilitated the black market trade, but, but, but enforcement that did nothing to curb that trade, such that 85 million Americans would be forced to flee their homes. Well, that's what happened to Colombians. And yet, despite that, look at what Colombians done has done, maintain civil society and democracy, green the, 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 the cities, created millions of acres of national park, sought restitution with indigenous people uh, in a way that no nation state can, can match, and frankly has paved its way for a kind of a cultural and economic renaissance, uh, 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 unlike anything ever seen in Latin America, as literally two generations of young Colombians forced to flee the country because of the war are coming home and they're coming from every city and every capital of the planet with skill sets in every conceivable endeavor. And I wanna just add one more thing for the American audience. Um, just think of how the United States has treated those who turn up at its frontiers, despite the myth of reception of the huddled masses. Colombia, by contrast, faced with a peace accord, which has a price tag of $45 billion, even as oil prices have plummeted, the main source of foreign revenue, uh, Colombia has, without fanfare, absorbed the biggest humanitarian crisis in the history of Latin America, 1.8 million Venezuelans who've come across the border. They haven't been stopped. The families haven't been separated. They've been housed fed, given schooling, and given medical care. No other nation I know has ever responded in such a generous way to such a crisis. So Colombia really deserves to have its story told. And that was sort of the mission that I tried to do in this book. I don't hide the truth of the history, but I try to explain it with empathy. And just consider one statistic. At the height of the Medellin cartel, the cartel accountants were budgeting $1,000 US a week to buy elastic bands just to wrap the dirty money in. In the last year before the peace agreement was signed and negotiated in Havana, signed in Cartagena, the FARC, the most prominent of the leftist guerrilla groups, down to maybe 6,000 cadre, mostly teenagers in search of a meal, nevertheless, through extortion and drug trafficking generated $600 million. Now you give me the Beverly Hills Boy Scouts and $600 million, I promise you I can create havoc in all of Southern California. So the point of this is that to some extent the world has been responsible in good measure for Colombia's agonies and more specifically anybody who has ever bought, distributed, or used illicit co cocaine has the blood of Colombian people uh, on their hands. And I, I, I hope that doesn't <clears throat> sound too harsh, but I know that's something that Colombians, in a sense, aren't allowed to say, Ambassador, but it's something that I say at every single opportunity um, because it's true. And, and thank you, and really thank you very much because we feel like that, we assume it, we live by it, uh, but as you know about Colombia, you know, we, we just absorb it and move on. The resiliency yeah, of no, Colombians no, the is resilience, The resilience of Colombia. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I could tell so many stories. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't even know where to begin. I'll tell you one of my favorite anecdotes in the book. And, and, and you know, I, I want to yield to Paolo and, and Juan Pablo. But I, I want to say that having um, Paolo and Juan Pablo here is so perfect because these are not just great environmentalists, great scientists, great advocates, but they embolize, symbolize one really amazing thing. Colombia is the only nation state I can name that was born not just in revolution, but born also in a vision of natural history. You know, when Simon Bolivar liberated not a little band of the Atlantic shoreline as George Washington did, but an entire continent, uh, he carried in his saddlebags as he rode 75,000 miles, the maps drawn by Alexander von Humboldt. Oh. Humboldt speak poetically about the natural beauty of the country. He internalized it and made it public policy. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, but the, the, the story I love to tell ambassador is, is I was around in, in Savannah de Torres, 
uh, with this great character I called Morita de los Manatees. He was like an avatar of manatees, these fantastic animals um, that are so emblematic of the, of the wetlands of the, of the Caribbean coastal plain. And he told me he always worked, you know, he, 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 was, he, was, he got his power from the animals. And if the FARC would come to the town or the ELN or the paramilitaries, he stood them down all the time and, and, and kept the integrity of his community. But he always worked with the young students uh, at the local school. And he told me one day, you know, that just around this little wetland, you know, this kids had collected 75 uh, species of butterflies. Well, I said, carajo, that's half of what we have in all of Canada. And then he said such a perfect Colombian thing. He says, ah, sí, sí, pero tiene que entender que en Colombia un mariposa es solamente un flor que puede volar. Es por eso que tenemos tanto. He said, in Colombia, you have to understand that a butterfly is just a flower that knows how to fly. That's why we have so many. I mean, that to me is the essence of Colombia. Let me, let me go to, uh, to, to Paula uh, first and then to Juan Pablo. Uh, uh, the Guardian about this book said something that I think it's, um, uh, uh, it says a lot about, uh, about, and let me get the quote because I'm losing it. Uh, okay, here it is. Magdalena is a geography book about a river that is also the political history of Colombia, but it's also an admonition of ecological disaster an impassioned defense, the defense of indigenous wisdom and the memoir of the author's various travels and friendship over the years. Uh, Paula, why has Colombia lived, uh, has given its back to the Magdalena River? Why, why the Magdalena River is not like the Mississippi that is so emblematic and, 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 and in the mind of everybody? Why, are, why do we live, you know, like, like, oh, it's just there. And what do we need to know to do to get it back on the imagination of, 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 of a nation. Well, I think what you do is you read Wade's book for starters. Um, Wade has a, some really amazing phrases in that book. And one is that he says, God having to, God decided to give Colombia one of everything. And I think in a way it's that embarrassment of riches. We're surrounded by, by such unbelievable natural wealth where, wherever we go, every crack in the street, there's something growing everywhere you go. It's just ecosystem upon ecosystem, as, as Wade was saying, that the book is a very powerful, uh, a very powerful tool at this particular moment in Colombian history. Colombians, we need a mirror to be held up to the complexities of our history and to the immensity of the natural wealth that we have. And this is an opportunity to really get it right. Sometimes the book has things at a crossroad, and it's very, very powerful to say that vitalization of the Magdalena, bringing it back from death where it is right now of utter and total devastation is the entry point. To me, the big carry away from what I take away from that book is one line that I think all Colombians should look at. And that is that rarely has a nation been given such an opportunity to envisage its future. And we should really, you know, put that in stone and put it on the corner of every single um, ministry of every single loyal uh, Laker, uh, uh, local mayor's offices, because this is really the opportunity to re-envisage what Columbia has. Wade, you really do justice to the extraordinary capacity and talents and scope of Columbia. But it's right now what the book is also is a wake up for Colombians to step up. Because when you talk, for example, of the master plan and the fact that there's 15 or 11 additional dams that are being planned, there is articles in the press every day where we continue to mismanage all our ecosystems and, and really look at short-term economic growth for the few rather than that collective riches for the many over a longer period of time. So I think the book is about three things. It really is a wake-up call on the sustainability side of the equation. And I know Juan Pablo will have a lot to say there because we, our rivers can be resurrected, but there has to be very deep political will to do that. And we just haven't found it. Right. That there really is a very deep connection between the degradation and equity. And I think that yes, Colombia has done remarkably in terms of land tenure for indigenous populations. Inequitable countries in the world, 
And I think that that is another, um, something that runs very strongly through the book of, of that amazing resilience of the Colombian people, of all its peoples, but of the fact that it, we have been, a, a, we've seen a history where inequity and enslavement and degradation have also been very much a part of the human history. And the last is the piece, and um, as you had Herman Sferro saying there, to clean up the river, wash the sun. Ferman Ferro says to clean up the river would be to wash the soul of the nation. If people do not understand the roots, they cannot untrust their future. And I think that that is really what the book is, is about. Yes, it's a way for foreign audiences for the rest of the world to reimagine and understand Colombia. But it's also an opportunity for Colombia to really live up to this opportunity that you have highlighted, Wade, of re-envisaging our future. And that is why I think, uh, Embajador, that the answer to your question is quite simply read the book. Juan Pablo, eh, you work at the IDB, at the Inter-American Development Bank. I met you when you were Vice Minister of the Environment. Uh, you're, you know, you're the head of climate change and, and sustainability in the bank. Uh, you're from the coast. Uh, you know very well the Magdalena River. Um, what should Colombia do? What should governments do? A, a Colombian governments, local, regional, and national governments. How can the international community help in looking at this river as 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 or with the importance it needs, clean it up, and and really make this river a model of uh, of sustainability and of importance and of uh, history as as Wade says in the book, uh, which is part of Colombia, and, and, and how can we recuperate that river? Thank you, Ambassador. And I would like to say thank you to Politics and Pros for, for the invitation and to the Colombian Embassy. And, uh, and I was saying before starting, thanks, Wade. Uh, I've been out of uh, Colombia for more than 15 years now. And uh, your book took me back to even when I was a kid. I was uh, telling that to Wade before, too. Uh, ambassador, I grew up in the coast in Cartagena. I live in Barranquilla. It was very sad when I moved to Barranquilla to see that the city was growing backwards to the river. And for me, the best uh, part that I had was uh, going to Las Flores, very close to the mouth of the river, to have a good, a good fish, a good pescado frito weight, and a good uh, rice with uh, with trim with camarón, mm -hmm. listening to to music. But uh, when I was a kid ambassador, my family from Popayan, I remember going back to, to visit my grandpa and my grandma every vacation. And my grandfather told me about the importance of, of nature, about the importance of Paramos. He talked to me a lot about the Paramo de las Papas. And he had a, a very important sign in the entrance of a little farm that he had saying, el árbol debe vivir para que el hombre pueda existir. You need really, you know, the trees to be alive for human to, to live. So I grew up ambassador uh, having a lot of respect for nature and for people. And I think the main call of the book, Wade, is that, that the identity, the cultural and natural identity has to be part of us. And we need to be very proud of Colombians about that, but we need to acknowledge that uh, the, the ambassador was saying, what we do every day has to be part of our identity. And I think, Ambassador, your question starts by asking ourselves, every day that we do some, some action, we need to think about nature and we need to connect nature with everything that we do. I think something that, we learn, that we've learned about COVID is the importance of nature in recovering trust as a society. I think everybody's valuing nature now like they didn't before. I think just after being you know, at home, being able to go out, to see a bird, to walk, to be connected with the river here for us in, in DC, to the Potomac, to the Anacostia, it is incredible what you feel. And I hope in Colombia, everybody's starting to feel the same. When they go out, what they feel, making that connection with nature. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, Ambassador, I think we need to every day value as humans, the importance of nature in uh, the ecosystem services that nature provides. You were asking me about uh, how we as an international uh, institution work with governments. Uh, the book took us on how all the ecosystems are connected. 
the paramos, the high altitude ecosystems with the rivers, and at the same time with the microbes, when you talk way about the Siena, about Barranquilla, and even when you mention Magdalena, uh, as a system, everything is connected. So that's, uh, Ambassador, what I think a government has to do right now. And by the way, I think the, uh, the National Plan of Colombia uh, is one of the first that I've seen connected with the SDGs. But Paula was a pioneer of these uh, before and how they are identified the connection of sectors with the SDGs. It's one of the first uh, national plans that, I, that I've seen talking about blue carbon and about the importance of mangroves related to sustainability, but also to nature and how to do sustainable management of mangroves. So if you go back to Paramos, the IDB had a very important program with, uh, with the national government, with, uh, with Bogota, with uh, the utility of Bogota, la, la Empresa de Energía Bogota y de Agua, sobre todo de Agua, and Conservation International, it was a project with the Global Environmental Facility. And it's a great example. We, we had ambassador four or five million from the Global Environmental Facility with an important counterpart for, from the national and subnational level. And the way we've learned on how the communities of the Paramo de Chingaza are working right now to protect the Paramo, but are having also sustainable activities with the high altitude abejas, with the bees, also to make you know, a productive use of, of abejas, but the pollinization is helping the paramo to be alive and silvopastoral practices with cattle raising. Now, the Minister of uh, Environment and Agriculture of Colombia are thinking about using this program and present a program to the National Royalty Fund for about maybe $30 million to replicate that in another paramo. So it's just to start when the book starts, wait. But then, Ambassador, when you see the river, I think a, a good example is what we did with EPM uh, for the Rio Medellin. If you see the quality of the river in Medellin, it's a good example. And I love Wade, how you have all the history of Medellin and uh, how Medellin has you know, the re re renaissance of Medellin. And the river, by the way, is part of that. Absolutely. It's one of the cleanest river. We had a, a loan, the water division of the bank for $450 million back in 20, 2009 to continue and finish the, the, uh, the cleaning of the river. But it's beyond just having a big power, a big uh, treatment plant. It's part of the identity of Medellin. Last time I went to Medellin, it's very important to see how proud people is in Medellin about the river. It's part of their culture. So I'm using this as an example because it's what we need to do now collectively about the Magdalena and saying to everybody at the cities, if you don't do an integrated solid waste management, everything will go to the river. As yourself, every time you are, you know, just throwing something, it will go to the river. But that's the conscience and basal that we need to continue every day working more. And I'll later talk about the Magdalena Bajo, about Barranquilla, the Cienaga, the role of the Cumbia, Carlos Vives in my second intervention. <laughs> You know, the, 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 it's interesting, you know, um, the, the voice of indigenous people uh, and, and uh, remains remarkably strong in Colombia. And in absolute numbers, there are probably more indigenous people in Colombia alive today than at the time of the conquest. Um, and uh, the mammals, is, it's, you know, Colombia has changed so much. When I was a student, parents of, of friends of mine at the Nacional, the University of Bogota, would say to me, you know, when I'd be going to live in the Sierra with the Arawako Mamos, the sun priests of the, of the, of the Sierra, uh, you know, ¿por qué quiere vivir con la gente sucia? Why do you want to live with the dirty people? Now, the last five or six presidents of Colombia, their first gesture upon um, being elected has been to go to the Mamos, pay respect to them, because the Mamos have emerged as a kind of a sign of continuity and, um, and patrimony. And when the Mamos speak of the river, you know, they, 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 they make ritual payments, not just at the mouth, but they traditionally would do pilgrimages all the way to the Maciso, a thousand miles. And they, they speak directly of measuring the consciousness um, and, and, and uh, quality of a pueblo, of a people, uh, of a community based on the relationship with the river. And it's so funny, it's not just Colombians, all of us, 
have this strange um, uh, relationship with fresh water. On the one hand, you know, anyone from the Christian faith, we, we drip it on the, the, the brow of our babies. We, we dump our babies in basins to give them the promise of spiritual salvation. And then we turn around and, and, and soil the rivers that are the source of that um, water, that holy water, in a way that can only be shameful. The wonderful thing about rivers is how regenerative they are. You know, the Hudson River in New York was so dirty, so fouled that you, they used to say you could tell what kind of car they were making at the GM plant at Terrytown by the color of the river. Um, the River Thames in London uh, was, deter was, def was, was declared a biologically dead river by the Natural History Museum in 1967, not even any oxygen in it. Now there are 125 species of fish. The Magdalena, if you could simply deal with the problem of the Rio Bogota, you would go a long way to cleaning up the Rio Magdalena. And I wanted to mention one thing that Paula talked about, the reprieve that Colombia has had. One, if there's one uh, uh, dividend of peace that's remarkable is that over the last 50 years, vast areas of Colombia have been off limits for industrial development precisely because of the conflict. And so when countries, for example, neighboring Ecuador made this decisions about their lowland force of the Oriente in the 1970s, pipelines, oil production, decolonization, deforestation, they've completely violated that, those forests. The Colombian Amazon, though now under threat, remains essentially roadless um, and it's an area essentially the size of France. So Colombia is in this position to make decisions about the future informed by 50 years of science and, and understanding of the importance of biodiversity and ecosystem management that simply didn't exist half a century ago when Ecuador made those sorts of decisions. And so the, 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 the potential of Colombia to seize this moment just in time is really extraordinary and again, this is a nation born of a vision of natural history, you know, with an abundance of, of gifts. Uh, you know, for a botanist in Canada, for example, to find a new species of plant would require virtually an act of God. In <laughs> Colombia, a botanist stumbles upon new species every day he or she is in the field. Uh, and it, it's just, there's no other nation like that. So, so again, we're on this amazing cusp. And I, and I think one of the important things about this book, in a sense, is that the, 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 the enemy of peace and the peace process, the en enemy of nature for that matter, is cynicism, negativity, despair, pessimism. And Colombians have a lot to be despairing about. The, you know, young people have not only suffered in terms of violence, They've also been raised for two generations as members of a pariah nation. You know, again, our good friend Carolina Barco, who was a predecessor to Ambassador Santos as the top diplomatic representative in Washington, daughter of a much beloved Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, uh, um, and herself former Minister of External Affairs, once told me, <clears throat> Um, that she had been essentially strip searched at the Dulles airport in Washington simply because she was Colombian. Now, if, when she objected and tried to share her diplomatic um, uh, privileges, literally her, 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 she was dismissed by the agent with an obscenity as if bark from the mouth of a dog. Now, if that happens to the leading diplomatic representative what happens to young Colombian students trying to travel abroad? My friend Sandra Uribe, who deserves a, 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 a paisa, I mean, paisa, she's mas paisa que los paisas. I mean, there's no, there's no more paisa uh, than, than Sandra Uribe. And I love her. I love her. She, and she, you know, I, I have to say publicly that only the conventions of, of publishing and the fact that I actually wrote this book can account for why Sandra's name is not on the cover with mine. She worked with me. Uh, every stage of this book, and we continue to work. We, we're partners in 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 uh, in all of our efforts together. But Sandra tells a very poignant story. Growing up in Medellin in the height of the Escobar uh, terror, uh, her house was nearly blown up. Her parents were nearly blown up when they simply went out to dinner one night. 
Uh, and when she at the age of 15 could not tell the sound of thunder from the sound of bombs, her family decided to send her to live in Miami with her grandmother. There, she was made fun of for being from the land of Escobar by Miami high school students whose main social activity was the pursuit of drugs with Colombian cocaine being their drug of choice. Sandra, a child of Medellin had never seen, let alone use cocaine. So again, you know, part of this, it, it, you know, Colombians cannot have faith in the future. They can't have faith in the peace process. If, 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 if they um, are burdened by the shroud of the past. And so, you know, one thing the book is trying to do is hold a mirror, um, not in a naive way. I, I don't think there's a better account anywhere in English of the agonies of the last 50 years, but those agonies are explained with empathy and, and understanding. And the point is made, not that there hasn't been violence in Colombia, but that is not what Colombia is. I, I coin in my uh, a term, I always say Colombia is, is not a place of violence. Es, una, es un país de colores y cariño. You know, it's colors and love. And this is the truth. I, I tell you right today, the only dangerous thing about Colombia, which incidentally has become the hippest tourist destination before COVID struck, National Geographic declared that Colombia was the hippest tourist destination in the world. And I can promise you, the only danger of going to Colombia is that you'll never want to come home. Hey, wait, let me go back to the book and, and something that Juan Pablo says, which is the musicality, because the book in the upper Magdalena, you have one type of music, you have this tiple music, you have this, uh, 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 to a certain extent, uh, uh, more uh, uh, Castilian, you know, the mm -hmm. guavinas y los pasillos, and, and you move down the river, and, and then in the end you go to Cumbia, and you have <laughs> this African with German, with a mixture, and, 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 and it's amazing how, how the river also has its own musicality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, Ambassador, that's what, like, if you go, um, well, first of all, um, there are the 100 top YouTubes in the world on the internet, 85 are music videos, and 12 of those are Colombian, point <laughs> one. Secondly, they say that Colombia is the land of a thousand rhythms. Actually, ethnomusicologists have identified 1,025. I mean, this is a land of music. I mean, music informs everything. Um, and, and um, you know, what, the, the, the linchpin, one of my favorite, my favorite city actually is El Banco. I just love El wow. Banco. It's such a great place. This is a lynch place. This is like the end of the Medio Magdalena, the beginning of the Lower Magdalena. Like the big river comes surging down and it kind of comes around this amazing bank where the cathedral is or the church and the steps and it's where lovers go to the shadows to, to get away from their parents and the old ladies are there. And it's just this joyous moment in every evening. And the river turns around and it just rolls over like a satiated lover. And from there onto the coast, it is pushed by the runoff from the Macizo. And, and, and this is both the home of Jose Barros, the legendary um, uh, musician of Colombia, um, the man who really elevated cumbia to, the, to not just being the rhythm of a nation, but the, but the musical soundtrack of the world. And, uh, but it's surrounded by all these communities where tambora, you know, and, and I, I asked Carlos Vivas, who's this legendary musician in Latin America. And he said very clearly, he said, you know, cumbia is the mother of poro, merengue, salsa, tambora, et cetera. But the mother of cumbia is the river. And this was a theme that every musician I spoke to somehow found a way unprompted by me um, to get to that that the river the music comes from the river you know the, we, 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 um, we the river the river is our rhythms without the river we are nothing and you know in a way you know when I did this book I, I, I spent a lot of time with a wonderful journalist from Medellin um, Juancito Betancourt and, and he had written his own book because um, he was in love with the Magdalena. And, and he used to describe his research strategy as 
sociology um, prompted by serendipity. In other words, he would just go to a community and wait until he found someone who had something to say that the world needed to hear, which as Hemingway said, is the key to good storytelling. And that's in a way what I emulated and, and, and practiced the whole journey with Juancito and Sandra and other friends you know, just wait till someone was there who had, and in Colombia, you don't have to wait very long to find an amazing voice. And always this idea of music and the river comes hand in hand. And so, you know, again, this is, this is, you know, you, know, you, you mentioned there's one, there's one, there's one just, you know, beautiful quote in the book Ambassador from, again, our friend Herman Ferro. Um, and, and, I mean, if, if people want to understand what the river means to Colombians, this is a verbatim quote from a tape recording I made of his interview. And he, and he said, I'll never forget the moment when I first heard that the peace agreement had been signed in Havana. By chance, I was at the very confluence of the Rio Cauca and the Magdalena. And the Rio Cauca is the great affluent of the Magdalena. I was completely overwhelmed by what I can only call geographical emotion, a sense of space, as if the spirits were emerging from the earth. I stripped off my clothes and placed my head in the river. As I stood in the sun, the water dripping down my naked body, I began to weep. Rivers of tears flowed as I realized that my son could grow up in a country at peace, a river that has known every tragedy, that has carried the dead and all the misery of the nation, that has suffered along with all Colombians, a river that I love so much, and there we were by its waters as peace came over the land. That so sums up the way that Colombians feel about this beautiful river. If if you would recommend to uh, an adventure, a tourist that wants to have some adventure in the Magdalena River, which would be the 10 places he should not miss? Uh, well, obviously the Maciso, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the river is born as, as um, Juan Pablo mentioned, these extraordinary paramos, which sort of feel like a Scottish moorland grafted onto the back of the, uh, of the Andes. You know, further south in Peru, uh, the high altitude puna or grasslands are dry, but as you get closer to the equator, there's constant rain. And so you have these absolute magical elfin uh, formations, um, the key characteristic of which is a plant known as uh, Espelitia or Frejelon that look in the mist as if a wandering friar in a spiritual habit. These are formations right out of Harry Potter. And, and they are unique really to Colombia. So the Maciso and, 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 and here's another cool thing. As you're coming across this ancient Incaic road in the mist, coming off the bottom, <laughs> dropping into the cloud forest uh, as, as a stone track runs away like mercury into the forest, the actual two arms of the Andean Cordillera are worn because Ooh. out of the Maciso, on to the east is the Cordillera Oriental, which eventually reaches all the way to the Caribbean, forming the border with Venezuela. To the west is the Cordillera Occidental, which runs up separating the western forest of the Chilco from the Cauca River. And then straight up the middle until it falls away um, to the Caribbean coastal plain is the Cordillera Central. But there's actually a point, it's unbelievably moving, where you can sit by a little stream and if you're on one side of, of the stream, you're in the Cordillera Oriental. On the other side, you're in the Cordillera Central. So you can literally reach out and touch the genesis of a great nation. And then the other place not to miss is going all the way to uh, the mouth of the river, um, uh, you know, the Boca de Ceniza, where, where this unbelievable community of fishermen live out on a jetty in these fragile shacks that a single wave could sweep away. And they fish only by night. And they fish with kites, which they put together with plastic garbage. 
and then floating kind of plastic uh, bottles. And they take advantage of a constant north wind that blows. And at night with their headlamps silhouetted against the Caribbean sky, they look truly, and they are truly heroic. And then in between is everything glorious about Colombia. Um, you know, a funny thing about the history is that, you know, when you look at stories of the conquest, it's sort of as, you know, every, all the focus is on, on Peru and Mexico, Cortez in Mexico, Peru, uh, uh, Pizarro in Peru, which is really weird as if Colombia was some kind of sideshow. The truth of the matter is more gold and precious stones came out of Colombia than either Peru or Mexico. Pizarro just had to walk across a beach at Tumbes to meet the Inca. The, the conquistadors who arrived in the homeland of the Muisca uh, had to fight through hell to get there. And part of the reason for that is Peru and Mexico, in terms of the chroniclers, had better press um, than Colombia did. But also the great ruins of Mexico and Peru were recognized immediately. Colombia has such incredible pre-Columbian ruins, but they remain mysterious and hidden away. You know, the, 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 the great settlement and, and civilization of San Agustin at the very headwaters of the Magdalena wasn't even accounted for or discovered until 220 years, 22 years after the conquest. And the great lost city of, of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, um, sacred to the Tyrona, as significant and dramatic an archaeological site as to be found anywhere in the Americas, was only discovered by Waqueros in the late 1970s. Archaeologists didn't even reach there to excavate until almost 1980, 1978. So, and I think that's kind of a metaphor for the wonders that lie beneath the surface of things in Colombia. You know, there is a, there is a kind of a surrealistic quality uh, to Colombian life that, that uh, if, you, if, you, if you travel with your eyes wide open to wonder, you're going to encounter it every day of your journey in Colombia. And when I say to travelers, what should I see in Colombia? I often say, it's not what you should see, it's what you should feel. Find some quiet place in the landscape listen to the whispered message, messages of the wild, listen to the sound of the cadence of the Spanish, so elegant, so perfectly spoken. Uh, pay attention to the generosity you encounter. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I used to think that bliss was an objective state and I had so many affirmations of that in Colombia. You know, I, would, I, I, I just can't even begin to tell you how, um, many almost uh, mystical engagements I had with campesinos and with, uh, with indigenous people. And one of the things that's sort of fun for me is that, is that now because I've been this, become this writer, uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I hang out with all the, all the fancy folks of Colombia, just like my three friends here. It's kind of fun, because I, I, Colombians <laughs> great. are all great. But you know, for the longest time, I never met anyone who wasn't a campesino. I mean, if you hear the way I speak Spanish, it's like I speak it from the street level, right? <laughs> and, um, and a lot of my friends, you know, who from more pr privileged families, uh, when they hang out with me in Colombia, they just can't believe the ease with which I just go into any scene in any barrio in cualquier sitio in el, in el, in, in, in el país because when I was a kid, that's all I knew, right? And in all of those travels, I never, as I said, was afraid. I just, I, I, I never felt more free, more happy, uh, more alive, and more spiritually inspired than in the months that I spent uh, on the back trails of Colombia. And I still, I still feel that today, you know, there's a very funny time, ambassador, you know, I was, um, as I said, Sander and I were always uh, uh, working together. And I, I, uh, I, one day after we had had a bit of a spat on, you know, we're tired and exhausted. I, I, I wrote her a little note about why I love Columbia. And I meant it just to, just to, to lift her spirits at the end of a long, a long day. And years later, as the, we, a, a journalist in her presence asked me why I had this love affair of, um, with Columbia. And before I could answer um, the journalist, uh, I mean, Sander pulled out 
what I had written her that day, which I had long forgotten, but let me just quickly read this. This explains everything, I think. I do long for the air of Bogota, that unmistakable scent that tells me I've landed on the savannah. It's hard to explain. When I talk about loving Colombia, it's something visceral, even sensual. To be away for too long is to be on life support. To step again onto the soil of the nation is to feel instantly that very sense of belonging that so long ago gave me the freedom to envision the man I've become. Whispered messages of a landscape unlike any other. The wild embrace of a people that allowed a vagabond boy to grow into a content and realized scholar. It is the very madness of Columbia that rescued me, like a sweet coefficient of the soul. My fire was so bright, so all-consuming, that I came very close to self-immolation. Only Columbia could match and give purpose to my passion. I was saved by that, and this is the key if anyone wants to, to understand my loyalty to the country. And that's really, that's really true. You know, here I can see, here I can see a, a Paula Caballero with a smile from one ear to the other. I see Juan Pablo, you know, lighting up with those words. Uh, Paula, any comment, Juan Pablo? It's, it's, I'm floating, I'm floating, man. I just, I just, I just love I just, uh, what you say. Way my Juan Pablo. My daughter, my daughter come a couple of minutes ago to say bye, daddy. And I said, listen, this is going to be your Christmas gift. <laughs> uh, because uh, as, uh, as Paula was saying, the resiliency of Colombian women is amazing. And I know I had mixed feelings when you were, when I was reading the Magdalena Medio, uh, the stories of Jenny and, um, and Diana in Puerto Triunfo, Puerto Berrio were very sad, but at the same time showing the resiliency of the Colombian women. And then, as you said, when you go to the low part, you go into El Banco, Monpox, and as the ambassador was saying, the history of music, going back to the first question of, of the ambassador, it's a collective action. It's not only the national government and the city, so national level, but, but it's also what civil society can do. And uh, what Carlos Vives and Claudia Elena are doing with uh, Tras La Perla as a foundation, not only for Pescaito, we have partnered with them for many works in Pescaito, but the love of them for the Magdalena. I mean, if you see Cumbiana, the last production of Carlos, is, as you said, it's the story of Cumbia as the mother of everything. But in the sure. past, the videos, uh, I was remembering the... Uh, Regresar a mi pueblo, go back to my town in Monpox. I mean, that, that video... Uh, it's amazing. So, Ambassador, uh, as you said, I was just floating here because I was thinking about Barranquilla. We had a, an amazing meeting last Friday at the embassy uh, with the mayor of Barranquilla for the annual meeting of the bank. And seeing how Barranquilla has changed in the last years facing the river. And everything right now is connected with the river. Uh, and the, uh, the mayor was talking about becoming the first biodiversity of Colombia. President Duque has launched not only the Leticia Pack meeting for the Amazon, but a big program for cities to be connected with biodiversity. And the mayor of Barranquilla was saying that they, I want to become the first biodiversity. So we were gonna prepare a loan for Barranquilla uh, from the ADB for 2022. It was already authorized by the uh, Ministry of Finance and the President of Colombia. And the key part of the loan will be resiliency to climate change with all the water management, as you know, for the rain but also the recovery of the Cienaga and mangroves as a key part for making that connection of biodiversity with people. So doing that for Barranquilla, continue working with Carlos Vives in Tras La Perla for Santa Marta, making the connection, as you said, with the mamos, I think is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Sergio Diaz Granados, who is connected, the director of Colombia, the ADB, is telling me way that it would be great to have you at the annual meeting of the bank. At the oh, I we have uh, about meetings about I'll cities, the connection of cities with biodiversity. You so, know, I'll do, I'll do anything for Colombia. You just have to ask. So, so we'll, so we'll have him in Barranquilla for the IDB meeting. Uh, Paula, any? Uh, aren't you feeling? Aren't you feeling? You know, so full of Colombianness right now. <laughs> I think that we're we're really privileged to have somebody of the depth and the the poetry because the book is 
is magistral, the way it's written. It really is quite extraordinary. But to have that Colombia, which is a country of so much potential, but also so complex and so full of these incredible contradictions, we need somebody to translate it for us and for the world. And I think that's what this book has achieved, Wade. It is a, it's a window into an incredibly complex country, a very unique place on earth, and you make it accessible for so many that will read the book. And as I said, you hold a mirror to Colombia, for Colombians, and it's a reminder of how much we have lost, how much is there always and still, and really what's at stake. So I'm glad that Juan Pablo and others will be giving this book to a new generation, because I think it has to be a clarion call for all Colombians to rise up to this opportunity and to really make good all of the great ecosystems, as you yourself said, that God gave Colombia. So we're privileged to have you be that universal translator of what Colombia truly means. So I thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you very and, much. And to finish, to finish, uh, uh, because I think it's time, uh, and we'll have to go back to Bob. At, uh, at uh, I would say this metaphor explains exactly what Colombia is, and the river is, and the mixture of music and God and heaven, and and hell and everything. That's it's Monpos. Mm. There's a there's a beautiful saying that says. Monpos tierra de Dios, donde se acuesta uno y amanecen dos. <laughs> Monpos land of God, where one goes to bed and two wake up. That's just such a you know everything and and really thank you Wade, thank you for for being such a great friend of Colombia. I just have no no words uh, that can feel uh, what I'm feeling for my country and for having such a great ambassador and such a great friend as you. Thank you Wade. Thank you very much to all of you. You're so kind, Ambassador. And thank you, Paulo and uh, Juan Pablo. And we should just me mention finally that, you know, one of my most important and uh, proudest moments came um, not too long ago when um, ex-presidente Juan Manuel Santos very generously invited me to become an honorary Colombian citizen. So that ceremony at the Palacio Nariño was, um, was one of the most moving moments of my life. So I'm extremely grateful for that. Thank you, Wade, and the Colombian Embassy, and our distinguished guest, Ambassador Francisco Santos Calderon, Juan Pablo Banila, and Paola Cavallero for a stimulating and very informative discussion of the book, Magdalena, River of Dreams, and the Story of Colombia. The book is available to purchase through the PNP link. On behalf of everyone at Politics and Prose, we thank you for your continued support at our and our efforts at the bookstore devoted to cultivating community and strengthening the common good through books, programs, and a respectful exchange of ideas. Good night, everyone. Thanks, good night. Guys. Good night.